What's up guys? So this video is actually going to be a Q&A video. So a while back I asked on Instagram and YouTube and Facebook for you guys to send some questions. I was going to pick the top 20 and go through and answer some of them. So I get this question probably more so than any other question, but usually from people outside of the hobby. Uh, I started working with amphibians first. It was a fire belly toad. Uh, and then that led into uh, green anoles and then leopard geckos and then bearded dragons and then corn snakes and ball pythons. And uh, over the years, I've worked with close to about 100 species of reptiles like this Chihua gecko here. It, they're just amazing. I don't know how you can not like them. So it's one of the things that's kept me in the hobby for literally my entire life. It's a challenge and sometimes I get it wrong. And I think most people that are in the industry now are getting things wrong when it comes to stacking so many genes. Like take for instance, this is a Lemon Blast Enchi Super Spot Nose Red Stripe. And there are some subtle cues in this that tell me all of that, but uh, I wouldn't be shocked if I got something wrong. And who knows, maybe there's an extra gene that I'm not seeing in this. You just never know. And Ozzy at Ozzy Boyd's coined the term theoretical ID. And that's literally just basing it off of what we can see and what we know is in the pairing. And the only way to really know for sure is to breed it. So one of the other things that was a huge help for me was actually growing up just a couple hours away from New England Reptile Distributors. Kevin's been a longtime friend and from a really young age, I was able to go there and ask him questions and really learn and understand like minor nuances between morphs and figure out what set certain things apart. Uh, so luckily because of that, I've just been surrounded by a lot of really cool animals uh, really early on in my keeping career. So that helped kind of catapult me to be able to confidently ID some of these ridiculous ball pythons that we see these days. Okay, so this is gonna become a two-parter here. One of my favorite species to work with right now is obviously the Amazon tree boa. If you've been following me for any length of time, I've posted a lot of Amazon tree boa content, uh, especially animals like my guy Carnage, uh, who's in shed right now, and my boy King, who is also in shed right now, otherwise I'd have them out. But these guys are incredibly misunderstood and <laughs> definitely are a bite first, ask questions later kind of species, which I kind of enjoy, um, but also they're incredibly misunderstood. And once you understand their body language, you really figure out how to work with them effectively. The answer really is no. Outside of the natural ambient temp shifts that have happened here in North Carolina, I have not done anything different uh, with maintaining them throughout the season. Um, I do do food cycling. So uh, when I get ready to breed them, I give them a little bit more food, a little bit more frequently. Outside of that, I don't do anything special for these guys. I don't drop temps, I don't do anything like that. And I've had multiple females just kind of start cycling on their own. But I'm gonna get this girl back before she actually does nail me. This is another one of my younger girls. This is actually a captive bred female for my buddy Brandon. Uh, and she is full of gusto and definitely wants to grab me here. But uh, I think Amazons are really starting to pick up in popularity. Um, more and more people are getting into them. They're definitely getting a bit more of the spotlight because these colors are absolutely insane. Look at how red that animal is. So I really think that Amazons are gonna start picking up in popularity. Of course, with their attitude, I, they're never gonna be something like a ball python or anything like that. But I definitely think for the advancing keeper that wants something different or wants just a really cool red snake, Amazon tree boas are gonna be the way to go. I've known him for a really long time. <laughs> uh, Lenny and I met through YouTube. Uh, we were both doing videos at that time and uh, he used to live in New York and uh, I lived in Massachusetts, but used to go to the New York Reptile Show all the time in White Plains. Uh, and we ended up meeting up down there and we hit it off and we were just always talking about different stuff. And uh, he would ask me questions and you know, he was always breeding cool and in interesting stuff. So uh, we just stayed in contact over the years. And when I started doing more work in New York, uh, we would just hang out. I would crash at his place and all this stuff. And uh, we just became really, really good friends. And it's probably going on, I don't know, 13 or 15 years or something like that. So working for Kevin at New England Reptile Distributors was definitely an interesting experience. And I'll explain, I'll try to keep it really brief. Uh, again, I've known Kevin for a very, very long time. Knew him before I started working there. And uh, Kevin's great. He's ADHD, he's crazy, he's all over the place, but he's incredibly smart. And it is without a doubt, first and foremost in his mind, about caring for the animals that he loves so deeply. Um, that being said, 
having a collection at that scale, especially today's day and age, is really challenging and really difficult. Uh, so I give that man a lot of props for continuing to operate at the size that he does. And I know that he's uh, downsizing and kind of shifting focus a little bit. And I think that's certainly a smart move. Um, you know, but he has withstood the test of time when it comes to business. Um, I mean, think about it. Nerd has been around for almost 30 years or about 30 years now. That's gone through multiple economic ups and downs. And, uh, you know, he's seen a bit of it all. He's worked with so many different species and is literally a wealth of knowledge on so many of them. And, uh, you know, he and I still talk very frequently. And, um, you know, I'm actually, I'm actually bummed. He was just out here in North Carolina doing some gator research and we weren't able to see each other. But, uh, but yeah, Kevin, it, working for Kevin was an interesting experience. That, again, size collection, uh, maintaining it, understanding how systems need to work to be able to keep everything maintained. Uh, it, is a, it was a very different experience for me, one that I'm incredibly grateful for. Um, can't say I would want to go do it again. <laughs> I like this amount of animals is far less chaotic, so I do like that a little bit more. So this is another question I get asked a lot. Basically... I just talked to him. <laughs> I just started to network with them and, and ask them questions. These are the things that were really important to me growing up because we didn't have Morph Market. We didn't have Facebook. You know, uh, it was really like a lot of word of mouth kind of stuff. You know, reptiles were not big on social media or anything like that. So it was, oh, I know this person who likes reptiles. They know this person. They're going to put me in contact with them and then we go from there. Or I had to reach out myself or go to a reptile show and see them myself. Um, so that was really the foundation of it. I will say it was uh, helpful to have met Brian and Kevin so early in my keeping career uh, and create that foundation and friendship. That helped put me in that same bracket uh, of people and kind of knowing people. They recognize me from videos or, or uh, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, so-and-so told me about you kind of deal. Um, and then, of course, working at Nerd. Uh, provided a lot of opportunities to connect with people uh, that I probably could have gotten on my own, but uh, the, the help of Nerd kind of boosting me uh, was certainly an aid in all of that. You know, being able to, to say like, hey, I'm so-and-so, oh yeah, yeah, you work for Kevin, I, I know who you are. And then the door just kind of be open from there for conversations and communication. Uh, that was a big help for sure. But after that, it still was about maintaining that networking connection and establishing some sort of connection with those people. Uh, I'd certainly recommend everybody try to do that. And, uh, you know, you never know. You, you might, you know, spark a friendship uh, with somebody that's been doing it for longer than you've been alive. And, uh, you know, a lot of those guys have forgotten more than we'll ever know. So to be able to have some of those people that I can just pick up the phone and call is, uh, I'm, inc I'm just incredibly grateful. So the short answer is I have about 15 or 16 different species that I currently work with um, from the Amazons to retics and berms and ball pythons, a myriad of different colubrids, um, obviously jungle carpets and brettles pythons. I have a pair of coastals here as well. Maclots pythons, the list kind of goes on. Uh, the most I've ever kept at one time when I was younger, still living in Massachusetts, my room was packed wall to wall with animals and uh, I kept a lot of amphibians and stuff back then. So at my peak, I probably was keeping around 30 to 35 different species at one time. Uh, but a lot of those were amphibian species uh, and smaller amphibian species. So it was a lot easier to maintain stuff like that in those numbers. My biggest season, honestly, I probably had about... I want to say maybe 30 clutches or so, which doesn't sound like a lot, especially if you look at like ball python guys that are producing, you know, 100, 150 clutches. Uh, but the thing to remember is I don't just breed ball pythons. So uh, that was a mix of ball pythons, carpet pythons. Um, I think that year also I had a retic clutch um, as well as a couple colubrid clutches. So there was a, there was probably a few hundred snakes out of those 30 clutches, just because some of those snakes were laying 20 to 30 eggs at a time versus five to eight eggs out of a ball python. So most of you who know me also know that carpet pythons are a big part of what I keep these days as well. This is a possible super caramel albino that I produced uh, about three years ago. But uh, anyway, I think when it comes to carpets, um, there's two parts to it, right? Morphs and lineage are both equally important. 
Um, I think there are definitely people who are, you know, more into the morph game, don't necessarily care too much about lineage. They want to make uh, just the coolest combo. Obviously, this is an integrate here of the uh, Caramel Coastal, and then Albino comes from Darwin. Um, but I really think at the end of the day, lineage is one of the most important things, especially when the only carpet pythons we can get into the U.S. Uh, that are wild caught or uh, farm raised are uh, the West Papuans. Anything from Australia, we're not getting. So knowing where your animals come from is a really, really important element to keeping, uh, especially these carpet pythons and really anything from Australia, just because we can't get our hands on any more unless something changes and uh, the likelihood of that, pretty small. There are a few things that I haven't worked with that I really want to. One of those things uh, is the rough scale python, which is another Morelia. Um, that are becoming more and more popular and common amongst Morelia keepers. And I'm very excited about that because uh, right now they're just a tad out of my price range. Uh, so hopefully as those prices come down, I can get my hands on a pair. Uh, and then I also uh, never worked with, but have been wanting to, uh, Bismarck ring pythons. And uh, I remember telling Rob about this and he just kind of gave me this look like, really? And, uh, you know, back in the day, they were $150 a piece and we couldn't get rid of them at shows. You know, uh, I've had the chance to, you know, like handle some, uh, but I remember helping at uh, the BHB table and he had some and they were like one of the hardest things to sell. And of course that meant that people stopped reading them. And then a handful of years later, people were like, hey, do you remember when everybody had Bismarck green pythons? Whatever happened to those? So a couple people breed them and the price skyrockets. Um, and of course, that's when I get interested in them is when the price skyrockets. So that is another species that I would like to keep that I have not uh, personally kept. So really just those two at the moment, I'm sure there's others, there's various colubrid species I would love to get my hands on to work with, but all in all, I've been really lucky to keep the animals that uh, I've always wanted, like this carpet python. So this is definitely another question I get often. Balancing the careers uh, is a challenge. I'm not gonna lie to you guys. There are definitely times where it's like a push and pull. Some years, reptile sales are great and I don't have to push music quite as hard. Other years, sales are not that great, but music is doing really, really well. So it's kind of been this push and pull. And I've had people over the years that have told me, you should just focus on one and really just kind of go full throttle on one. And, you know, maybe there's some validity to that, but I've certainly experienced instances where if I only focused on one, I would have actually been in a really tough spot. But I've been really lucky for a long time to be able to do what I love and pay my bills and, uh, and do that. So I don't necessarily want to take the step back, right? So having the two has been really, really helpful. That being said, the instance that I'm in currently is, you know, sales slowly started to die down at the end of 2022. Pretty much everybody's experienced that. At the same point in time where music really started to push ahead for me. I got connected to some really great bands that are constantly working and have been really pushing doing remote studio session work and being able to record for people uh, from home, which is super nice and convenient. Uh, so with that, it's also put me in a position to say, hey, if I do need to travel for one of these projects for a long period of time, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of animals are going to make that really difficult. So if I can zero this in and kind of narrow this down, focus on like my ultimate projects, have stuff that's a little bit easier to maintain, I'll probably be putting myself in a much better position for one of those instances. Because luckily I have really good friends that I can call that are comfortable with this number of animals and can really get through the work pretty quickly uh, if I did need to go away for an extended period of time. So that being said, uh, being able to pivot and move like that is really important. So having a really manageable number of animals is also very important so being real with myself to know what that's like uh, has probably been the most important thing when it comes to balancing the two careers is really knowing where I'm at and being able to have that conversation with myself that's uh, that's been a very very important part in being able to balance uh, both careers this is a tricky question uh, I am one that always likes to think about the future in the next five years uh, I certainly see myself doing quite a bit of stuff with music for sure I have zero plans on getting out of the hobby a hundred percent I've gotten to a point now numbers wise where I'm very comfortable 
uh, with maintaining everything and feel comfortable that if I needed to go away for a decent amount of time, I have some people that I can call that can maintain this efficiently and effectively while I am away. In the next five years, I don't really see myself expanding all that much. I see myself really dialing in on certain projects and pushing certain projects forward and really just having a collection of animals that I truly enjoy working with. And that's really where I've gotten myself to at this point. So this is really like setting up the foundation for the next five years. And I think anybody that's been in this business long enough will tell you the same thing. It's a constant evolution of working with different animals. And at some point you get to a point where you're like, I wanna work with that again, cause that was really cool and I miss it. That's definitely where I'm at now after having kept so many different reptiles for the last 20 plus years. I'm definitely at that point where I'm like, I just wanna work with the stuff that I really, really enjoy, that I know uh, will be self-sustaining so I don't have to come out of pocket to maintain. Uh, that uh, again, also, I just, I'm gonna love every moment of working with them. All right, and with that guys, that's it. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Thank you to everybody that submitted questions. I'm really, really appreciative. Uh, I'm super stoked to be making some more YouTube content for you guys. More videos are coming soon, including some videos from the upcoming travel I've got with Daytona and Tinley and Animal Con. I cannot wait to start doing more content for you guys. So don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and I will see you on the next one.